Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to those of you at home to Southminster Presbyterian Church. So glad that you can be with us there and that we have some people here. We can have up to 25 people each Sunday until we can open more. So if you're at home and you haven't signed up yet, you can sign up for another Sunday, and we hope that you will do that. The signups for May will be available closer to the end of the month. I'll remind people here today, I think Josh already did, that we can't sing right now in the sanctuary, and you'll be dismissed by Rose at the end. We'll have our fellowship outside. Also, I noticed that last week I got very self-conscious because when we are on the live stream, there's a little delay in the video, and so I've learned that I have to kind of wait a moment after each new part when we're beginning a new thing or we're ending a thing um, so that they can catch up at home. So if I'm just standing here smiling, don't think I've forgotten what we do next. It's for the benefit of the people that are watching from home. Couple of announcements. Our Girl Scout recycling drive is going on. Um, Claire Battelle is collecting plastic bags, thin plastic bags, which we can't recycle in other ways. And she's collecting them just inside of door five downstairs near the office um, for the month. So if you would do that, you can help be good to the earth and help her Girl Scout project at the same time. Um, we, were gonna we are going to have an upcoming class that both Laura and I will be teaching on nationalism, patriotism, and the Christian faith. It's a two-part class, begins next Sunday, and the second one is on May 2nd, 2 to 3.30, um, in person, so only 25 people can pre-register. Um, it'll be either in the pavilion or in the CFC, depending on what the weather is like. And it's about discussing church and state and religious identity and political identity and the difference between patriotism and nationalism. It's not people duking out their side or, or their understanding of issues. It's not about that. It's just about what does all this mean as we are Christians trying to be faithful Christians on one hand and patriotic people on the other. Also, um, our new fourth and, and fifth grade ministry called Power 45 will begin today with Josh from 4, 15, from 4 to 515 at the church pavilion. We hope our fourth and fifth graders will come. VBS signups will begin at the end of April, and if you're willing to volunteer to help, please contact Josh as soon as you can. And VBS this year will be June 7th through 11th, 9.30 to noon. Remind you at home of the digital friendship pad and the live chat during worship. We hope you will participate in both of those. And now let everyone who's at home and everyone who's here prepare our hearts and our minds to worship God. There we go. Can you hear me now? Good morning. For those of you at home, I invite you to light the Christ candle. If you are able, would you please rise and join me in a call to worship? Where shattered hearts are made whole, where wounded souls are healed, where life is stronger than death. There is no control. Where the lonely become friends, where a stranger is welcomed home, where hope is stronger than despair. There is Jesus where closed minds are opened, where the anxious find serenity where love is stronger than hate. There is Jesus opening our hearts. The stone has been rolled away. Jesus is our companion on the journey. 
our eyes are opened to the needs of others. Christ is risen indeed. Thank you. Please have a seat. Again, as we come to the passing of the peace, it's going to look a little different now that we are during COVID epidemic here in the church. While we are seated, or I'm actually going to invite you to stand, but stand in your where you are, and instead of greeting everybody, oh my goodness, I'm sorry. Let's back up the train here a little bit. Let's do the prayer of adoration and praise. Let's pray. Risen Lord, we thank you for your presence among us and in your whole creation. We rejoice in the sweetness of spring and for everything that sends down roots, reveals buds, and stretches to the light. Thank you for the gentle stirrings of faith within us. You bring peace into our souls so that we may bring healing to a troubled world. May we discover gratitude for all of your blessings, God, and may we find ways to feed your sheep and care for your lambs. Amen. Give to glory. 
Okay, now we will do the passing of the peace. Uh, but before we do that, I was getting ready to say that for those of you who are in the sanctuary this, for today, we invite you to stand where you are and just look around you to your neighbors in the pews. And instead of shaking hands, uh, hugging, we invite you to stand and place your hand over your heart and just acknowledge each other and say hello. We're going to take just a few moments for that. But before we get to that, the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Please greet your neighbors by placing your hand over your heart and just looking around. You may be seated. Let's pray. Guide us, O God, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light we may see light, and your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The first scripture reading today comes from Revelations 5, verses 11 through 14. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne, and the living creatures and the elders. They numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, singing with full voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing, to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. The word of the Lord. loves me this i know for the bible tells me so little ones to him belong they are fragile but he is strong yes jesus loves me yes jesus loves you can come me too. yes jesus loves me the bible Do you know what? You are the first children that I have seen up here in over a year, and I am so excited to see you boys. I think you want mommy too. I probably look kind of scary in my mask. <laughs> mommy will hold you. I won't hurt you, I promise. Well, can you see me on the screen at all? Yes, I got a thumbs up. That's good, because it's the first time I've sat down here too. Well. I like to color and to create things, to draw, to make things. Do you guys like to do some of that kind of stuff? Do you like to color and make things? You do? Well, you know what? When I do those things, sometimes I mess up. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. Maybe if you were playing with Play-Doh or clay or something and you made a dinosaur and you made his neck too long and then it just kind of fell off. And then you tried to stick it back on, but you're smushing it in there, and it just doesn't work. And so sometimes we mess up. Well, I like to paint pictures. And you're going to have to look at a screen up there because I'm going to get her to show this flower that I painted. And I painted that flower up there with watercolors. Now, the thing about watercolors is it's really thin. And you start with the light colors, and then you get the dark colors. But you know what? When you use watercolors and you make a mistake, it's hard to fix it. Because if I did that whole thing and then I wanted to put something light where it's dark in the background, it wouldn't show up. So that's why I don't use watercolors very much. I like to use oil paints. And I'm going to show you a picture I did in oil paints. See the little bird and the flowers? And what I love about that is if I mess up or even if I change my mind, 
I can keep changing it. Do you know those flowers, the first time I painted them, they were yellow. And then I decided to make them purple, and then I didn't like the purple, and I made them pink. You can see a little bit of yellow and purple in them, but they're mainly pink. And actually, I, I, that's one of my paintings I've kept, and I do that to remind myself that there are ways to start over. So our Bible story is one where there's a disciple named Peter, and Peter really messed up. When Jesus was headed for a cross, Peter forgot he was even friends with Jesus. He was scared, and he went, and he hid, and he told people he didn't even know Jesus. But after Easter, Jesus came and was on the beach, and he was talking to Peter, and I think Peter really, he felt bad, and he probably thought Jesus was mad at him, you know, because he'd not been too nice to Jesus. But instead, Jesus says, I love you. I forgive you. When we make mistakes, God always will love us and forgive us, just like your parents. Maybe you do something wrong sometime, and they let you know it was wrong, and they need to do that so that, so that you'll do okay but they never stop loving you, ever. And it's really wonderful because we know that about God. God will always love us no matter what mistakes we make our whole life long, and I think that's pretty wonderful. Let's have a prayer and we can all, including everybody out there and at home, repeat after me. Thank you, God, for loving us so much. Even when we make mistakes, even when they're big mistakes, Even when they're big mistakes. We're, really happy we're really happy because we know you still love us. Thank you. We love you too. Amen. Amen. Thank you, boys. I was so excited to see you here. Bye.
Our second scripture reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? And they answered him, No. So he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he had said to him for the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and used to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, Jesus said to Peter, Follow me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. (coughs) Let us pray. O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Maybe you once saw the musical called Into the Woods, if the Broadway play ever came out this way. Somebody's doing this in the back. Oh, it's Ben. Yeah, Ben is one of our thespians, so I guess he has seen that. Well, it begins with a song called Once Upon a Time. And we see all of these characters from just about every fairy tale you remember appear on the stage. And then the drama weaves through all of their different stories, the different character story, until it ends the first act with the song Happily Ever After. But by the end of the song, you realize there's a second act to the play. So what are they going to do with that? Everything has already been resolved. Everything is already happily ever after. Then, in Act 2, you discover that the wife of the giant that Jack killed comes down the beanstalk to seek revenge. Cinderella is getting bored and restless in her marriage. And Rapunzel's handsome prince cheats on her with another one of the fairy tale characters. Well, you can see where all of this is headed. 
the play doesn't end with happily ever after. But not all is lost. The characters who survive their ordeals work together to try to rebuild their lives. Sometimes, happily ever after isn't the end of the story. When we read about the disciples after the resurrection, it feels a little bit like that, doesn't it? Easter seemed like a happily ever after, but time moves on, and the realities of everyday life set in for Jesus' followers, just like it can do for us after the alleluias of Easter morning, when we then go back to our Monday morning routines, and much is the same as it's always been. The disciples' lives have been like a roller coaster. They've shared this amazing experience together of being by Jesus' side during his ministry. And then they endured the week that started with the cheers of Palm Sunday and Hosannas as Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And that week ended with betrayal, with denial, with abandonment, with crucifixion. Then there was the joyous surprise of Easter, followed by a reminder that Jesus would be going back to God, leaving them there. After all the stress and the grief and the uncertainty, it seems that Peter and the disciples just need the comfort of something familiar. Now, some of them used to make their living as fishermen, and so Peter says, let's go fishing. And the other disciples say, okay. They're out all night, but they don't catch a thing. At dawn, when Jesus appears on the beach and calls out to them, suggesting that they put their nets on the other side of the boat, as you might expect, they get a big old haul. But the impulsive, excitable Peter doesn't even wait to help get all those fish into the boat. He just jumps into the water and swims to shore. Jesus is beside a charcoal fire with some fish and some bread, and they all when the other disciples join them, sit down for breakfast on the beach. Don't you imagine that Peter, who usually talks so much that he trips over his tongue, is pretty quiet at that first breakfast with Jesus? There must be some awkward silences where the only sound is the waves lapping against the shore or the crackling of the fire. Surely Peter remembers the last time he warmed himself over a charcoal fire. It was in the high priest's courtyard when Peter was asked if he knew Jesus, and he even cursed. He used, the, and the two boys are here, so I'm not going to say it, but he used the curse word and said, I don't know him. When Jesus was arrested and led to the cross, Peter was nowhere to be found. He had fled. He had abandoned Jesus to his grisly death. Peter must be carrying the guilt of that betrayal around with him every day. He's a broken man, shamed by his cowardice when Jesus needed him most. Peter probably defines himself as the fallen disciple, the one who betrayed Jesus. You see, we carry our past along with us. I was once reading an article about people who can't seem to live down their past, and I came across the name of Fred Snodgrass. Now, anybody my age or younger probably hasn't ever heard of Fred Snodgrass, but if you're older than I am, you may have. He played for the New York Giants, but not the football team. Apparently, there used to be a New York baseball team called the Giants before they moved to San Francisco. In the 1912 World Series, when the Giants were tied with the Red Sox, a fly ball fell into Fred's mitt, and he dropped it. They lost the World Series, and everybody blamed him. Although he made an amazing catch in the next play, although he would later become a very successful banker and a mayor, all anyone could seem to remember about him was that one mistake. When he died in the 1970s, 
The New York Times obituary title said, Fred Snodgrass, 86, dead, ball player, muffed 1912 fly. I certainly hope that Fred put his blunder in better perspective, that he didn't let it become his sense of identity. Can you and I let go of our failures, our mistakes, even our sins? Peter had denied Jesus three times when that rooster started clucking and crowing, and the pain of that betrayal suddenly cut Peter to the heart. When the meal is done in that breakfast on the beach, can't you hear Jesus clearing his throat? <clears throat> Peter, could we talk? Jesus has just grilled some fish, and I have to believe that Peter is wondering if Jesus is going to grill him too. But does he say, where were you when I was going through the worst day of my life? How can I ever trust you again? Why did you do that to me? Instead of any of that, instead of accusing or shaming, Jesus simply asks Peter three different times, do you love me? Jesus isn't asking that question because Jesus somehow needs validation or to have his ego stroked. The three affirmations of love mirror Peter's three denials. Jesus is offering a way for Peter to experience redemption and restoration, to let go of his sense of guilt and shame so that his broken heart can heal. Paul, uh, Peter, is redeemed so that God can work through him because God has a purpose for him, just like God has a purpose for you and for me. While Peter might have thought everything was over, it had just begun. Instead of being the whole story of his life, Peter's past can serve to teach him some lessons to help him grow in wisdom and compassion. Perhaps Peter isn't handed a blank canvas, but handed some oil paint so he can paint something new and better over it. He can't figure out what needs to be changed or recreate. He can figure out what needs to be changed or recreated to make his life more beautiful, more meaningful, to have more purpose, to be more faithful to Jesus. Jesus knows what Peter has done, and he is saying, I love you. I believe in you. I need you to go to work now. Be my witnesses in the world. Saying you love someone isn't enough. Christian love is about more than what you believe. It's about more than what you feel. It's about what you do and how you live. And so at each profession of love from Peter, Jesus responds, feed my lambs, tend my sheep. In his earthly ministry, Jesus showed us how to do that, how to take care of people especially the poor and the hungry and the ones who are pushed to the margins of society. He even cared for the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the thief on the cross next to him. He's saying to Peter and to us, love me, love my people, and not just the ones you know or like or feel comfortable with, love them all. If you really want to follow me, go and take care of each other. Know that I love you. But I'm always ready to forgive you, but let your life be about more than your own needs. Friends, can you and I put ourselves in this story? Are there times when you have made choices that you know were wrong that hurt someone else or hurt yourself? Times when you felt broken or like you just couldn't live up to what was expected of you? Times when you said or did something you couldn't take back or when you refused to forgive someone who desperately needed it from you, times when you felt like maybe you just let God down. None of us gets through life without some measure of brokenness. And yet Jesus meets us wherever we are and asks, well, do you love me? Then follow me, 
be my hands, be my feet in this world. Your past doesn't define you. You don't need to be held captive by it. Civil rights leader and theologian Howard Thurman once said, no event in your life can imprison you. This is what resurrection is about. I will not allow the events of my life to make me their prisoner. I will continue to believe that God is not through with my life or with me. Friends, Jesus invites us to leave the empty nets of our guilt and our shame and our regret behind to be open to the abundant grace of God. God loves us in and through our brokenness, invites us to wholeness and the work of discipleship because God isn't finished with us yet. We are given the grace of a new day. In your mind's eye, put yourself on that beach in Galilee. There is Jesus saying to me, Nancy, can we talk? Fill in the blank with your own name. As Jesus asks you, hey, can we talk? Do you love me? Feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. In the resurrection at the beach, Jesus already has a few fish cooking when he invites the disciples to bring some of their own fish to add to the shared meal. Jesus takes us by the hand, puts his own spark of compassion in our hearts, and then we have that capacity for overflowing love. We have something amazing to offer this world. Easter is not a celebration of the past. It is the proclamation of a new beginning. When guilt-ridden Peter thought he was no longer useful, God had other plans. At the end of the story, Jesus just said, follow me. And so we follow. Even when we're tired, even when we haven't had any success, we just keep putting our nets back in the water and we never give up. Sometimes we might echo that Scottish fisherman's prayer you may have heard, Oh God, the waves are so big and my boat is so small. We see the overwhelming need and sometimes we don't feel like we can change anything or help anyone. It's possible that we won't even see the difference that we make in our lifetime. Yet when we live as though we really do love Jesus, that love comes pouring out of us and it touches this world with healing and with hope. Amen.
as thus do call me. Oh, Lord, with your eyes you have searched me, and while smiling have spoken my name. Now my bolts left on the shoreline behind me, by your side I will seek other now time for our presentation of offerings. If you're at home, you can give online or mail in a check to the church office. And if you're worshiping with us in person, there is a box in the narthex and you can drop your offering in there on your way out. Thanks be to God for all the gifts that we have given to God. Our joys and concerns. These beautiful flowers here were given to the glory of God by Pearl Scott in loving memory of her husband Neil. Are for our concerns, we're praying for Pat B, who's home from the hospital, but her, but is still undiagnosed. For Darius, who had a mitral valve leak surgery on April 30th, and for Lynn, who's a family member of Pat K, who's being removed from a ventilator today. A prayer for all of Lynn's family and friends. Praying for those with COVID, Irene's son, Scott, who's in the hospital on oxygen, but is improving. For Mike F., who's a friend of Dick and is battling multiple my myeloma. And former members, Frank and Carolyn, both have COVID and Frank has been hospitalized. Their, Frank's granddaughter, Skylar, is also in the hospital after a bad auto accident. We continue to pray for Adeline, the 13-month-old great-granddaughter of Bob and Dottie, who had a successful heart surgery last week and is home and recovering. For Dottie, for Dottie, who's also recovering from surgery, Judy, recovering from su surgery, Susie's brother-in-law, Bill, Joy, a friend of Joyce, who's recently diagnosed with cancer, Jeff, a friend of Bob and Dottie, who's very ill, Marvin, the friend of George, Bill, Kate's brother-in-law, Stacy, Lisa's niece, Peggy's brother, Doug, Levi, a young child with brain damage, Tom, an extended family member of Pat, and Walt, is receiving treatments for cancer. Now, will you pray with me? Oh God, caring for your world is a heavy burden. How do you do it each day? How do you see your beloved creation crying out in pain and go on believing that all things will be made right? How do you see the children that you made in your own image go on to hurt and oppress and even kill others and still love them? How, O oh Lord? We ask because we are not sure if we can love and hope and trust in the way that you call us to. This world is so broken, and there is so much to mourn. The news is enough to break our hearts every day. We cry out in lament and sorrow for Dante Wright, his whole family and community. We pray for his young son who will grow up without his dad. We pray for every black man in America who is afraid that something as small as an air freshener dangling from his rearview mirror will be the cause of his execution. We pray for all those who live with a deep fear of those who are supposed to protect them, for mothers and fathers of black and brown kids who lie awake at night wondering if their kid will be the next hashtag and headline. Oh God, our tears are not enough to describe our pain and lament for the awful killing of Adam Toledo. 13 years old. For his parents and family, we pray that you surround them with the grace and strength that only comes from you. We pray for the victims of the FedEx shooting in Indianapolis and their families who are mourning their loss. We pray particularly for the Sikh community who have faced so much racism and hatred in the past decades as they mourn the four Sikhs who were killed in the shooting. 
God, the violence is all around us. We are barely surviving a pandemic while fighting off an epidemic of gun violence that kills more and more of our neighbors each day. 40 mass shootings in the last month. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. God, show us what we can do to be peacemakers in a world desperately in need of peace and justice. Convict our hearts that we may not be content with the absence of violence on our streets, but on all streets. Teach us what it means to beat swords into plowshares in a nation that clings to its weapons. It seems wrong that we would witness so much violence and death in this Easter season. Teach us, Jesus, what it means to be people who believe in resurrection. Teach us how to believe not when it is easy, but also when it is hard. Teach us to be your light to a world living in darkness and pain. Teach us what it means to feed your sheep. Remind us of your promise that through you we can do all things. So let us pray the prayer you taught your followers to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. in peace. There will be times in your life when you feel broken, times where you might feel defeated. But remember that through Jesus Christ, you are always loved. There is always a new beginning. Christ has risen. Amen. <laughs>